class. Shall we pray? Father God, we want to bless you. We give you praise. We give you honor. We exalt your name. We commit ourselves again one more time to you. We know that it's not by our power, neither is it by our might, but it's by your spirit. We ask that your spirit take over all that we do tonight and that human thinking do not have a place here. But we shall be surrendered to your divine uh, leadership and your teaching and your understanding. In Jesus' mighty name we are prayed. Amen. And um, I want to apologize that you might be hearing the wind very strong. I believe we're about to have our first major rain here. And um, I have to be outside so that the network will work. Okay, so let's go into what we have for God has for us today. But I would like to just do a quick recap of what we said last week. Last week, God led us to the blessedness of having nothing. How wonderful it is to have nothing. And um, God led us to understand that the foundation of Christianity, even the foundation of the work with God, the foundation of the creation of humans have always been around um, having nothing. Not having anything at all, just having God enough alone. That has always been the foundation of Christianity or the foundation of the work with God. God has always chosen between, has always asked us to choose between himself and the earth. So it has always been like that. And within the week, um, while I was preparing and asking God for my own personal lessons, actually, God took me to um, where Jesus spoke about mammon of unrighteousness. And I had to quickly leave that note for us within the week that um, when God created heaven and earth, actually, and put Adam and Eve here, they had nothing from this world except their flesh. And that flesh that they had also had nothing extra from this world. Not one single thing extra did they add to their body. Their body was just... So the only thing from this world that they had was just the skin of their body. And they were taking fruits to feed that skin. And that was the uh, the flesh. And that was all. So they gave the flesh the minimal quantity of attention that you could ever give it. And as at that time... There was no sin in this world. Not one single sin. The world was, the whole earth had no sin. There was no sinner. There was no iniquity. There was no killer. There was no murderer. There was no foster. There was nothing. And yet the whole world was without sin. Because the two human beings that were on earth only took what is necessary from the earth. Every other thing they left it. So, um, when sin came was when the one thing on earth, something on earth that God said, do not touch this, man went to take just one little extra thing, just a fruit, that was all they took extra, and that little extra they took from the earth became a big problem, and the whole earth now filled with sin, and that was when uh, man and woman had to go and look for leaf to cover themselves. And God himself, who has created them and has um, left them naked and never told them, cover yourself, cover yourself, is the same God now that went all the way to kill an animal and use the skin of the animal to do clothes, to cover the nakedness of Adam and Eve. So, and that was where it stopped. So, God as at that time, came to tell us that, okay, in this uh, scenario that you guys have seen, I'm going to give you just a little bit of this earth again to cover your nakedness. And that's, so it became a standard now 
that we have to cover our nakedness because God did that step after we fell into sin. So, um, and God allowed us to understand that to Jesus and to God, when they created the heavens and earth, a man had nothing. Everything was perfect. But immediately man committed sin. Man started having things. So man was chasing after accommodation because God chased them out of the Garden of Eden. Man was chasing after food because God chased them out of the Garden of Eden. Man was chasing for transportation. Man was chasing for this, that, that, that. So majority of what we have today that we call enjoyment, that we call uh, necessity, this, the heavens see it as something that came out of sin. If man had not sinned till today, we will be plenty in the world walking around naked. Nobody will be thinking of collecting another person's wife. Nobody will be thinking of raping the neighbor. Nobody will be thinking of stealing. All of us will be only righteous and good if we have not sinned. And all the sins that we have today will not be here. I want us to understand it clearly now. The cars that we have, the houses we have, the set of designer clothes and the shoes, the bags, the televisions, the sound system, the gold, the banks, and the education, and all the things that we have today, none of them will be available. And the earth will be holy. So Jesus, who was here, when we committed sin, which led to what we have today, now calls all we have mammon of unrighteousness. I need us to understand that. And um, I don't need us to understand that everything that we hold now that is so dear to us, that is so important to our life, is just um, an addition that came from sin. So whenever Jesus sees it, all he sees is, this thing came out of sin. If they have not sinned, they wouldn't be chasing after this. Um, uh, and um, when Jesus Christ came to the earth, you will notice, because he knows the foundation of everything, he lived in such a life that was so simple and empty. For instance, if you notice that Jesus never fought for a house, neither did he build a house. Jesus never built a sanctuary. You know, they didn't like him in the synagogue. The messages he preached, they don't like it. So they were trying to kill him. Jesus could have gone to build another auditorium for himself, but Jesus did not do that. Why? He lived a very simple life. What was he teaching us? He knows the foundation of the earth. He knows that everything here came from iniquity. So what he did was, he took as little as possible. He only took what he needed. Where he doesn't need it, he doesn't waste his resources to get it. I hope you're understanding. I'm just laying the foundation for where we are going today. So you can understand where Jesus was coming from and why the first instruction he will ever give disciples has to be this matter. If we can't cover it today, we'll continue next week. So um, Jesus took the little from the earth. He lived as much, as little as possible. Remember that Jesus did not have a house. He didn't have a house when he was here, yet he was living. He was moving from place to place with 12 men, and he never built or bought a house. Why? He was taking so little from the earth, so that there was nothing that will hold him in this earth. Um, Jesus, in the time of Jesus, you know, even before Jesus came, we already had horses. We had oxen. Um, if we go as far back as Abraham, you know they've already had oxen. So the means of transportation was not by, by walking. It was by animal. So they have these asses that they climb upon. The king uses horses, but ordinary men uses oxen. And you know, Jesus could have gotten oxen for his ministry and gotten as, as animals for his disciples. So they moved emas. But Jesus decided that, no, 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 no. I want, I want to use the barest of the minimum from this Mammon of unrighteousness. All I see here on earth was birth from unrighteousness. If man had not sinned, the man would not need all these things. So Jesus took the barest minimum that he can take from everything that you can find on earth. You look at the um, and his disciples and look at the way they run everything. They took the barest minimum. 
And when Jesus now had surplus, because he was a prophet, he was performing miracles, he was healing people up and down. Many things were happening. So people were giving, God was sending people to give to his ministry. Jesus did not hold any of those things. Rather, what Jesus did was that he had a pause. And the pause was for helping every other person. So he never, he never kept it. It's one thing that Jesus was so poor that there was no food to eat. And so that was why he was poor. No. Jesus had access to all these things. Remember when Jesus was going to the, to Jerusalem and he asked his disciples to go and take two animals and bring it for him because he wants to enter into Jerusalem. And know where the disciples went to meet the owner. And they told the owner, we need this. The owner did not argue with them. He gave it to Jesus. That is, all this while, I had warned us before that it is raining here, and I think it's our first major rain. So if the noise, if there is noise, please bear with me. But I hope that you can hear what I'm saying. I hope I'm... Um... Wow, this is serious. <laughs> it's a very heavy in here. Okay. So, Jesus could have gotten anything Jesus wanted. If he had wanted all things, all he needed was to tell his disciples, go and get me an oxen. And the owner will not be able to argue with Jesus. If Jesus needed a house, he probably would have just said, get me a house. And he would have gotten for him a big house. But I want you to note with me that Jesus intentionally took the barest minimum that he needed for his ministry on earth. Jesus took the smallest that he can take. So he only lived by what he needed. Every extra thing that he did not need, Jesus did not get. Why? Because Jesus sees it that because the foundation of this world and the foundation of the things here came from sin, Jesus continually sees them as mammon of unrighteousness. I hope you are getting it very clearly. So, um, on this foundation, Jesus now decided to teach his disciples. But before we go into the first instruction, I want us to quickly check the book of John chapter 3 verse 18. John chapter 3 verse 18. John chapter 3 verse 18. He says, He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already. Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. I needed this part of the Bible to commend our teaching. Because this is the problem we have today. This is, as a Christian, when I talk to know Jesus, there And the one that has been put in the Bible, that any believe Jesus, anyone that does not believe Jesus, has been condemned already. It is not that the person will be condemned. It is not that on the judgment day, that person will be condemned. It is not that, oh, the person will now do something, and that person will be condemned. No. Anyone that does not believe in Jesus naturally is already condemned. And that is it's whatever instruction that Jesus gives. We have I know um we have it. Three or three in here, but I believe the network will still work for us by the grace of God. So, um, as believers, who wants to go to heaven? 
as believers who doesn't want to be content. We have no choice. There is no second option. There is no um no other way. There is no other method that we can run this life except we believe in Jesus. We have no choice. That is all the instructions that Jesus gave. We have no choice but to obey them to the fullest. That is when we are not condemned. For everyone who obeys five out of the instructions, he still condemned because he has not fully and totally believed in the begotten Son of God. Anyone who obeys thirty out of the instruction that Jesus gave, and he neglected one, two, three, or so. If he... Sorry, that was next. Network. Anyone who forsakes one or two instructions of the instruction of Jesus is still condemned because he has not believed in the name of the begotten Son of God. And that is the big issue. And that is the reason why we have decided to sit down together and go through the instructions of Jesus one by one and into detail. And understand it into detail. What exactly does Jesus mean? And we will not be picking these instructions singularly. We'll be looking at the entire scriptures. Because I want to let you know that from Genesis to Revelation, they all support Jesus. Jesus is the number one message. Every other thing supports Jesus. So we are going to be looking at it on all sides. What is Jesus speaking to us about? And I pray that God will teach us well in Jesus' name. And the grace to hear him and receive these instructions, God will give it to us. So it is important to know that for every instruction that Jesus gives us now, there is no debate. We are not going to say um, we don't really believe in it. It, maybe there is another explanation for it. No, we are not going to do that. We are not going to say, um, we don't like it. So could we try something else? No, we can't do that. We are not going to say it is difficult. Ah, it is difficult to do. We cannot say that. Because if Jesus, who loves us above all, Give us that instruction. It is not us. It is because he cared for us. It is because out of his deep love, he has instructed us to go this way. Um, you know, when a child is very sick and you are telling the child, what do you want? The child will be asking you, telling you, I still want ice cream. And you will be telling the child, no, with the way you are feeling now, we need to give you drugs. And the child will tell you, the drug is bitter. The drug is not sweet. Mommy, I don't want. Daddy, I don't want. The drug is bitter. But because you love that child, out of your love, you want to ensure that that child overcomes that sickness as soon as possible. So what do you do? You give that child drugs. It is bitter. It is not sweet. But it's for the better. Sometimes we are the ones that we take our children to the hospital to be given injection. And when the child sees the needle, the child starts crying and starts wailing. I don't want it. I don't want it. Don't shoot me. I don't. But what happens to the parents? You will hold your child yourself and clean the child down with your might so that the doctor could pierce the body of that child with a long needle. That we pain the child and we cause tears to the child. Even sometimes that point that was punched in the skin will have blisters. We get swollen. 
And the child will look at you and say, Mommy, I don't like you. Daddy, I hate you. Could you have brought me to be, to be, to be a punched with a long needle? You are wicked. But actually, you are bringing this child to this point because you love the child. Whereas the enemy of the child will tell the child, Despite the fact you are sick, don't take any medication, don't go to the hospital, or don't go for prayers. Just stay there and die, because I want you to die early. And the child, knowing fully well that the other side is bitter, we prefer to stay with the enemy. Now, I am using this analysis to explain that when we begin to look at the instructions of Jesus, they will not look sweet to your ears. They will not be delicious in your mouth. They will not look good to your flesh. Naturally, you will dislike these instructions. But that is coming from the one who loves you above all. Who loves you enough to have decided to die in your place. Who has a throne in heaven. And he has angels worshipping him. And he decided to enter into what he ate most. That was sin. The world is a world of sin. And Jesus ate sin. The Bible says the eyes of God cannot behold iniquity. But this same Jesus left the comfort of heaven. Left the palace of his father. Left everything and entered into the same human being he created. And made himself into a tiny baby. And started eating sand in order to grow and die for the sake of me and you. So that we can have access to heaven. So this person who has gone all the way, who has lost everything before, just because of us, is the one speaking to us now. So when you are looking at the instructions of Jesus, we should not look at it as... We, they are trying to make heaven difficult for us. No. That is not what Jesus is doing. He loves you so much that the only way to, to help you to enter eternal life is, where, is what he's teaching. The best way to live this life and overcome and the devil will not have power over you is what he is teaching us. He has also taught us how to access eternal life and live forever because he knows that the enemy wants to kill us and he wants us to die. So that is the reason for all instructions that Jesus is giving us. So I want us to view it from the point of view of love, a loving God, not from the point of view of a wicked God, a, a, a hard God. A God that is too serious. No, 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 no. That's not where, that would be a wrong view. And that's how the devil wants you to understand it. But that is not what Jesus did. He came to die for you. And he came to surrender all he has. Just because he wants you to enter eternal life. So he decided to take your place. So let's go to the instructions of Jesus now. Um, in the book of Matthew, uh, Matthew chapter 5. We have something we call the attitudes. The attitudes. If you break that word into two, you have be attitude. That is the attitude to be. The kind of attitude you need to have in order to become a disciple of Jesus and in order to enter into eternal life. I want us to note here that the, the instructions that Jesus gave wasn't given to people that has been with him for years. Actually, Jesus just started the discipleship with his disciples. He had just selected them from a few days ago and um, started his ministry fully from a few days ago. So, and those few, and within those few days was when Jesus was teaching these things. Secondly, I want you to note that Jesus left the crowd, climbed the mountain, 
so that the disciples alone will come to meet him when he was teaching this. So this wasn't taught in the crowd. Um, I am not surprised that we are having very few numbers in this group, especially when it comes to discipleship. I'm not surprised because if we have announced that we are having healing program or have announced that God has just told me that breakthrough is coming people's way and that we should connect for a prayer at this time, trust me, we'll have a large number. And many times when we do such programs, self, I need to use other means, Zoom and Telegram, and we have about minimum of 30 persons on both platforms. But because this is discipleship, just as it happened in the time of Jesus, it is happening again now, that Jesus will climb up the mountain, and only few will climb up after him to go and learn from him on how to be a disciple. So, the attitude is the attitude of the disciple of Jesus. If we do not possess this attitude, we are not disciples of Jesus. We are just churchgoers, or we are religious people. Unless we obtain all these attitudes that Jesus laid down here, we are not yet um, disciples of Jesus. So, let's go to the first one. Matthew chapter 5, verse 3. Matthew chapter 5, verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, I've always had issues when I'm explaining this Bible verse to people, the devil has found a way of confusing us with the use of English or the use of language. So whenever we say, blessed are the poor in spirit, people naturally interpret it as poverty. And I've had over time to explain that poverty and poor are two different things. And um, poverty is lack of access to basic things. Poverty is lack of access to basic things. Um, being poor is limited access to basic things. Limited access. Okay, so again, poverty is when you have zero access to basic things. Something that is very basic to life. And the person have no access to it at all. Such a person is suffering. Being poor is limited access to something. So if you go back to the instruction of Hello, okay, I believe I'm back now. It says, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Now, if we convert that to the description of being poor. He says, blessed are the, are those who has limited access in spirit. Okay? Let's stop there. Now let's explain some things further again. When you say that that guy has a good, that guy good in spirit, he has a good spirit. The guy has a kind spirit. What does that mean? It means that the person is kind in spirit. So in the inner person of that person, the person is kind. So the person's actions is being controlled by a spirit of kindness. So when you say a person is kind, 
uh, is a kind-hearted person. It means that the person is kind in spirit. It also means that the spirit of that person is naturally kind. So whenever you see that person, when anything happens, kind. So, if we now go back to the word, blessed are the poor in spirit. If we use our substitution for words, blessed are those who have limited access in spirit. If we now go further to break it down, we'll say, blessed are those whose spirit helps them to have limited access. I hope I'm, I've not lost us here. Yeah? Blessed are those who by their spirit live a life of limited access. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, the Bible did not tell us that blessed are those who have absolutely no access. Then that would have been poverty. Then we would have said, oh, serving God will give us poverty. But I want us to understand that the meaning of poverty itself is when a person does not have access to something that if you do not have, you will die. Many have now converted poverty to other things and we have given it a meaning that confuses being poor and having poverty. So if I have no food to eat, absolutely no food, no food in the house, no food anywhere, and morning to night, food didn't come to me then that person has poverty. There is no access to food. But when the person has limited access, is that the person has not died from lack of food. God is providing the food one way or the other. Then the person is poor. He's not suffering from poverty. The person can trust God as, I will eat today. And before the person sleeps that day, the person will eat. That person is poor when it comes to food. He's not suffering from poverty. I need us to understand very clearly. Because we have converted, now this world has converted limited to mean poverty. No. And we'll get to understand this better. Jesus never suffered on earth from poverty. Jesus was a man that was going about with 12 strong men. They were not 2022 20, kind of men who are eating pizzas and eating um, uh, conflicts. No, 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 no. These were ancient men who eat real food. They were men who treks long distances and they needed to eat so much. And Jesus was feeding 12 of them, including himself. And he had extra money Enough to give to the poor. So if we are to look at a man who runs a ministry, able to feed 12 able men, and at the same time has enough money in the purse to be giving out to the, to the poor people around him, we would have said that such a man is a rich man. But at the same time, this same Jesus... Who has this access to these resources? Does not have a house. Does not have an oxen. Does not have extra set of clothes. He lives a very simple life. And he has limited access to sweet things that you expect him to have in the office of a prophet. Or in the office of a miracle worker. Yet, he did not have it. Rather, he kept himself at bay and limited his use of the things on earth. And from him, we now get a, a clue into the meaning of the word, blessed are the poor in spirit. 
So from the lifestyle of Jesus, we are able to understand that when we come to Christ and we Christ, it doesn't mean that the basic things we will need in life will not be available. No. And that's why Jesus went ahead to tell us that in our prayer, we are just to ask for our daily bread and that he will ensure that our tomorrow is taken care of. So he has already assured us that coming to him and having a relationship with him means that you will have access to the basic things you will need in life. But how be it, you will, be, you will have a spirit that is satisfied with limited access. Just keep seeing everything we have in this earth as mammon of unrighteousness. Let me digress a little. Brethren, have you not noticed that the more civilized the world is becoming, the less of the old-time religion we are having. Have you not noticed that the more civilized a society becomes, the more foolish the people in the society becomes? If you look at your locality, your country, especially those of us who are from African nations, you will note with me that many years ago, when civilization has not come the way it is now, nobody in his right senses can try to legalize men sleeping with men and women sleeping with women. Or legalize a man deciding to become a woman and a woman deciding to become a man. Or legalizing that you shouldn't you should, uh, animals should be given animal rights and all those funny, funny things. What is happening? The more civilized we become, the less of God we have and the less of the true religion we have. And that goes also into the church. So when a church just starts and they don't really have the money, the resources and everything, you see that the pastor is teaching the word of God and everybody is calm. Then the more prospered they become, the less of the old way they have. What happens? The more you get of the mammon of unrighteousness, the less of God you have. So when it comes to Christ now, he says that if you want to have the kingdom lifestyle, you want to have a lifestyle that everyone will be pleased with, the first thing that need, you needed to do was to become led by a spirit that helps you to have limited access to the mammon of unrighteousness. Um, during the week also, when God was speaking to us, he told us, he gave us an example, that cocaine is a hard drug. And almost everywhere in the world, um, if you are caught with large quantities, uh, you will be arrested. And uh, we have so many people in the psychiatric hospital today. They run mental. Their brain fell sick because of the hard drugs that they've taken over time. And um, anyone that cannot stay without the drug is called drug abuse. You are expected as a human being to be able to live on earth without the use of daily drugs. So anyone that cannot live or cannot function without a drug, such a person is said to have drug abuse. But the same cocaine that is a drug abuse, in its controlled quantity, is put into drugs to help people that are sick. There are some kinds of pain relievers, painkillers, that has a little controlled quantity of cocaine. 
And that control quantity, when it is used, kills the person and relieves the person of pain. But when the person now takes that drugs and converts it to, I cannot suction unless I take that drug. We now call it drug abuse. Now let's come back to our lesson. When Jesus was teaching us poor in spirit, that is, our spirit must grow to be able to control our access to the things on earth by limiting our access to the things on earth. As in our spirit itself is the one that has the power now to control our flesh and reduces it to the control quantity that it is needed. Why? Because the mammon of unrighteousness, as Jesus called all these things that we are looking at on earth, the mammon of unrighteousness can easily be abused. When you have the mammon of unrighteousness in quantities that is not controlled, you will begin to have abuse of the mammon of unrighteousness. And that becomes, you know, if it's dog, call it dog abuse, it now becomes mammon of unrighteousness abuse, if I can use that word. Christ is telling us that the mammon of unrighteousness, you need to control the quantity that you have. So you need a spirit. So blessed is anyone who has been able to come to Jesus, to receive of Jesus a spirit that supersedes the desires of your flesh to get more and more of the mammon of unrighteousness. And you have now gotten from Jesus a spirit that controls the number of things you get on earth. Such a person is blessed. And such a person can now have access to the kingdom of heaven. And this is... And this was the recurring teachings of Jesus over and over and over again. That our access to the mammon of unrighteousness must be reduced to the control quantity. And that whenever you have access of the mammon of unrighteousness, it will affect your access even into heaven. Now let's go into other things that Jesus said. Let's quickly run down to Matthew chapter 16 verse 25. Matthew chapter 16 verse 25. We are looking at controlling your access to mammon of unrighteousness. That is what God is uh, uh, leading us to. So let's look at the various instructions that Jesus gave concerning this matter. The various instructions that Jesus gave concerning this matter. Um, Matthew chapter 16 verse 25. It says, for whoever wants to save his life, we lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, we find it. So, here we are getting Jesus speaking to us and saying, your life on earth, if you try to save it, and you want to be rich in the life when it comes to this earth, what will happen to such a person is that such a person will lose that life. But if a person allows himself for the sake of Christ to lose the life on earth, the person will gain it. Um, let's, let's go further. Let's go to Mark chapter 8 verse 35. He's still saying the same thing, but it's explained in a better way, in other ways. Mark chapter 8 verse 35. Mark 8 35. For whosoever wants to save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake and for the gospel will save it. Still the same thing, still from Jesus. Let's go to Luke chapter 9 verse 24. Luke chapter 9 verse 24. For whosoever wants to save his life will lose it. Uh, but whosoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Let's still continue. Um, Luke chapter 17 33. Luke chapter 17 33. Luke chapter 17 33. Whosoever tries to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life will preserve it. And finally, 
They've all been giving us one, one words. Now let's come to the final one. John chapter 12, verse 25. John chapter 12, verse 35. John chapter 12, verse 25. Whoever loves his life will lose it. But whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. And that's where we are going. Whoever loves his life will lose it. But whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Now let's go back to the instruction of Jesus. He says, Blessed are they who by the Spirit of God has limited their life on earth. They are, they are, they are, they have limited the use of the mammon of unrighteousness on earth. For they will have access to the kingdom of heaven. Now let's put John chapter 12 verse 25 and add it to Matthew chapter 5 verse 3. So let's join the two verses together and convert it to one. So it'll be like this. Whoever does not love their life on earth, by allowing the spirit of Christ to help them to reduce the number of things they would have enjoyed on earth to please their flesh through the mammoth of unrighteousness, we preserve their life, we gain back their life and have access to eternal life. Is he now making some sort of uh, sense? Is it coming to a point where we can understand what is being said? I'm going to repeat it again. I'm joining now the words of Jesus together because Jesus, all his instructions form one. So I'm, I'm taking another instruction from Jesus now and I want to join it together to form one word, <coughs> one set of instruction rather. So it goes like this. Whoever do not love his life on earth enough to allow my spirit to limit the usage of the things he would have enjoyed on earth for the sake of Jesus will have preserved his or her life. And because the life has been preserved, such a person will have access to the kingdom of heaven. So, what we are simply saying is that the reason why you want to attain and get more of the mammon of unrighteousness is because you love your life on earth. And because you love your life on earth, that is the reason why you will go an extra length to get more of the things of mammon of unrighteousness into your life. Because you are thinking of preserving your life. You are thinking of protecting your life here. That is why you go an extra length to get more things from this earth in order to make yourself happy because you love yourself. And for everyone that loves himself, such a person will get more and more and more for himself. And when the person is getting more, the person is losing eternity. But when a person allows the Spirit of God to come into his life and help him to control the access to the mammon of unrighteousness and reduce it to the barest minimum that is needed for life, such a person preserves his life and gains it in heaven. I hope we are getting to understand. I have heard a lot of people try to explain it and say, when we say poor in spirit, it doesn't mean that it has to do with things on earth. It's just in your spirit. Inside your spirit, you just be poor. No, that's not what it means. We cannot even get that from the various teachings of Jesus. And the reason why I've taken all those verses is because I want us to understand that this instruction of Jesus was not taken out of context. Jesus did not just give this instruction. This was the teachings of Jesus all through the Bible. 
in various places when he was meeting various people and was teaching various things, it was the same instruction that Jesus was giving over, 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 over. All his messages support all his instructions. Even his own lifestyle supported instructions. So I want us to still go further to some other verses. I was going to join all those verses together and look at in fullness what is Jesus trying to tell us. I want us to go further down to the book of Matthew chapter 11 verse 15, verse 5. Matthew chapter 11 verse 5. Matthew 11 verse 5. This is when um, uh, John the Baptist was asking them, please, I need to go and ask Jesus, is he the savior we are waiting for? I need a confirmation. And Jesus said, the blind receive their sight. The lame walk. The lepers are cleansed. The deaf hear. The dead are raised. And the poor have the gospel preached to them. So right from the beginning, Jesus has always told us that those who can receive the gospel of Jesus, are those who are poor. Here, you are, if you note here, he's not talking about being poor in spirit, but those who have allowed the Spirit of God to make them recognize that nothing in this world satisfies them except God himself. And who are not interested in getting extra from this world because Jesus was enough for them. To them, gospel was preached. I want us to go further again to Mark chapter 10 verse 21. Mark chapter 10 verse 21. This was the story of a young man who came to meet Jesus and said he wanted to follow Jesus. And he told Jesus, I have obeyed all the instructions, the Ten Commandments. I pay my tithe. I give, I give offering. I do this, I do that. He has a long list of how he has kept the law. And Jesus replied him and said unto him, now I want you to I want you to be I want us to be very careful. Mark chapter ten verse twenty one. Then Jesus beholding him loved him. So you see this poor little young man. He has been doing many things, doing many things because he wanted to serve God. And when he came to meet Jesus and said, "I want to follow you," Jesus looked at him and said, "Ah, I love you." And because I love you, I will give you the key to following me. I will give you the key to eternal life. Because I loved you so much, it's time for me to give you the key to eternal life. And what did Jesus say unto him? Jesus said, one thing thou lackest, go thy way, say whatever thou hast, and give it to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come. Take up the cross and follow me. Ah, what is Jesus telling this man to do? You have loved yourself so long that you have amassed for yourself the things that you don't need. What I need you to do now is go and reduce the love that you have for yourself and for your life on earth so that I can give you access to heaven. Now, at this doctrine, Is this not negating seriously the lectures that we have heard that if Jesus loved you, he will give you prosperity. He will give you big money. He will open big factories. He will, he will prosper you that you will have 40 cars, you alone. And that when God prosper you, you will have Three private jets. You will have houses in all the major cities in the world. And God will do this and God will do Is this not opposite? Because from what we are seeing here, when Jesus fell in love with the young man, and Jesus just loved him so much. Jesus in his heart said, I love this guy. Because I love you. I'm going to render you poor. So that you can have heaven. Now please, I need us to understand that poor, Jesus did not say, I'm going to render you into poverty. Jesus did not tell the young man to go and close his business. The businesses that gave him the, uh, the prosperity, Jesus didn't tell him to go and close it down. 
Jesus always said, the excess you are carrying, all these riches that you are carrying, please, go and release it. So that you can have access to treasures in heaven. So if I want to take this aspect and join it to Matthew chapter 5 verse 3, the instruction from Jesus, we will now say, blessed are those who let go the excesses they have by the Spirit of Jesus and who has limited their access to the usage of mammon of unrighteousness in order to please Jesus. For they have lost their life on earth and they will gain their life in heaven. I'm trying to add all the verses we have used together today. Because they all form part of the instructions of Jesus. They are all the same thing. They are all saying the same thing. So when the young man came to meet Jesus, Jesus felt, you have too much of the mammon of unrighteousness. Too much of these things is a problem. I need you to reduce it to the barest minimum. Now let's come to practical. I'm sorry that it has taken me a while to explain this. And I've not finished the explanation. But so that we could take practical from today, let me give us some practicalities. Let's come to practical now. Mammon of unrighteousness. Now, when the Spirit of God, if you allow the Spirit of Jesus comes to you, to lead you, you will discover that there are some things that we have on earth that does not make any sense. They are just extra mammon of unrighteousness that we actually do not need. Let's, uh, let's start from, let's start from sisters. Let me start from sisters. This afternoon when I was preparing for this message, the Holy Spirit was asking me some few questions. He now said, you know, um, okay, let's, let's take general, everybody generally now. I won't pick just sisters. Let me just take everybody generally. There are some things that we'll do that does not add to our life. It does not add to our existence. Whether we have it or we don't have it, it does not mean we are going to die. It adds absolutely nothing to the quality of life or the life that we have. But we tend to go after it just for the sake of going after it. And they are gotten from this earth, they are mammon of unrighteousness. And they heap more mammon on, on, on our lives and they are not really necessary in this life. I will give us an example. Chains, bangles, uh, all those funny, funny things that people wear on top of their bodies. Now, has anybody had an accident and they said, oh, thank God it was the chain that saved him from dying? Or, or, or somebody had cancer and said it was the chain that helped or the bangles that saved the person from dying? I, I thank you. Or maybe, you know, the food you had only digest better because of the bangles and the chains that we are packed on, put on top of our bodies. Has there been any benefit whatsoever from the use of those things? Absolutely none. But what has the devil done to us? He has allowed us to pack to ourselves extra things that we naturally do not need. At all. I will go further. I won't, I won't, I won't, I won't, I won't stay there too long. Clothings. When you enter some people's houses, you have like three different wardrobes filled up with clothes. And you have a rack filled from up to down with shoes. Now, has anybody died because he had just two pairs of shoes? Say, ah, he wouldn't have died though. If he had just had seven shoes, it was the seven shoes that saved the person's life. The three the person had was uh, was too small. So the person had to die because the, the shoes were not enough. Has, has that ever happened to anyone? Or has it ever been that, oh, because she was repeating clothes. You know, every month she wears that cloth every month. 
at least once or twice in a month. She wears that clothes. That's why uh, she died. Or that's why he was killed. You know? Has there ever been... <laughs> and so why have we packed that thing? We have loved the world. You know, the Bible says, uh, do not love the world, neither the things in the world. For anyone that loves the world, the love of the Father is not in that person. Praise the Lord. <laughs> so, um, this extra that we are getting is because we have not surrendered to a spirit that can help us to limit the use of the mammon of unrighteousness. Brethren, the mammon of unrighteousness is needed basically for just the little dose that you need to live by. Any extra become an abuse. And no substance abuse will have access to the kingdom of heaven. And this is where the erroneous prosperity messages that has crept into the church today actually was sent by the kingdom of darkness. It came from the kingdom of darkness. And anyone who preaches such, uh, such messages is unfortunately either intentionally or unintentionally an agent of darkness. Preaching something that is entirely different from what Jesus laid down for us. So when Jesus was on earth, he led us through the scripture to understand that his own spirit will help you to live a life where the, where you have limited access, where you decide to agree to having limited access to the things of this earth. So you cannot see a disciple of Jesus who for no reason, just for himself alone, having seven cars is not possible. It's not possible. Why? He is trying to limit the number of mammon of unrighteousness that he have access to. Same as Jesus did when he was alive. And same as the instruction of Jesus to everyone that Jesus met. It got so bad that in the book of um, Mark chapter 12, verse 42 and 43. Mark chapter 12, 42 and 43. Mark 12, 42 and 43. It got so bad that when people were giving their offering in church, the only person that Jesus accepted our offering was the person who has the limited dose of the mammon of unrighteousness. It's so bad that all those who came to give offering out of their abundance was rejected by Jesus. It was so... <laughs> and when, when we begin to study Jesus and look at Jesus very well, we begin to, you know, wisdom begins to come to us and we begin to see the folly in our beliefs all this way. All the beliefs we have had before that, that is not justified by the Bible. We can't find it anywhere in the Bible. It begins to, um, how would I say it? We begin to, God begins to open our eyes. When people came to pay an offering, the only offering that Jesus noted that was an offering that was accepted in heaven was from a person who had limited access to the mammon of unrighteousness. Every other person that has extra doses of the mammon of unrighteousness, their offerings were rejected by God. If we are to take that now to the way our church is run, brethren, will you believe with me that in our billions, today, Sunday, We've gone to church and we have paid offering again. And based on the instruction of Jesus, if we have to look at it critically, all the offerings that were given today, majority of them were rejected. If we have to look at it based on the instruction of Jesus, that out of all that gave offering, it was only the poor woman 
whose offering was accepted. So after that person, Jesus said their offering was rejected. Why? Because they gave out of their abundance. <laughs> Praise the Lord. They were not poor in spirit. So because they were not poor in spirit, all they have given was nothing. But the woman who has nothing else and gave Christ all she has, was the one that was accepted. So the big question you are going to ask me now is, how do I become poor in spirit? Because, okay, am I supposed to sell everything I have? Am I supposed to let go my cars, my houses, my clothes, my children? (laughs) Am I not supposed to go to office again and make more money? Am I supposed, what? Okay, so how? Do I become poor in spirit? If God will not even accept the offering if I am not poor in spirit, if I have not passed this test, if I have not lived this life, whatever I am giving, whatever life I am living is rejected of God. How do I do this? How do I become poor in spirit? Uh, This will take us to next week. We can't go there today. We have not even completed today's message. Maybe within the week I will try to send a message again to complete it. So that we can go into how do I become points. What I've tried to explain to us is the rationale behind Jesus' instruction was because this was how Jesus lived his life. Jesus lived a life where he had limited access to mammon of unrighteousness. And Jesus is saying that the only people with that we have access to heaven are those who did not have substance abuse. Substance abuse is anyone that has excess, extra, of the mammon of unrighteousness. So when Jesus is seeing you, he must see that you are using the correct dose of the mammon of unrighteousness. Jesus must look at your life and see that you do not love your life enough. Jesus must see that you are following his instruction of losing your life in order to gain heaven. That was a clear instruction from Jesus. He said, whoever gains his life on earth, will lose it in heaven. Whoever loses his life on earth, will gain it in heaven. So those who are poor in spirit are those who have lost their life on earth. Everybody have access to something. And everybody is doing it. But you decide to lose your life. Hmm. You know, um, your mates in the office, you are all of the same salary kida. And they've all gone to buy latest cars. And you have access to that money to buy another car. But because the one you have using has this point, you are not buying another one. And, and everybody tells you that life is passing you by. And as a female, they tell you that see life, see fashion, see what everybody wears. As a man, see how your guys, see how everybody keeps beards. You know, the beard gang. This is what everybody do. Life is passing you by. And Jesus is saying, if you lose that life, then you gain it in heaven. If you gain the life here, you lose it in heaven. So unfortunately, the way our churches are, the way the ministries are run now, they are telling us, gain life. Get everything. Get everything. God will give you everything. You can have everything. You can have this. Live as you are. Gain this. God is not concerned about your outward. It's only the spirit. What are they doing to us? They are allowing us to live a life where we are gaining the earth and gaining our life and gradually we are losing heaven. And if we have lived according to the way they've taught us, we have become human beings who are religiously entering church and having religious activities, but who are not disciples of Jesus, who have not surrendered their spirit to be poor and limited here on earth so that they can lose their life here on earth and gain heaven. And that is why every time we hear about people dying, I'm always afraid because I look at their life and do and shake my head. I don't think this one is going to make it because even the first instruction, poor in spirit, I can't see it. I can't see it. And I, excuse me, I get jittery. How many people will make it? 
when the simplest of instruction, the first instruction, we have missed it. I'm going to stop here. We have spent one hour, ten minutes. And it's just supposed to be one hour. I'm going to stop here. So if If anybody has any question, I will want us to take the question now. Or if I have any question, I will beg of you to type it or send us a voice note into the group. I will listen to it and I will respond. I will, whatever you can post the question even right now. I will take my time, we'll listen to it, then we'll respond to it in the group. And so that we can close this meeting. Um we have not scratched this topic very well. And um I don't know how we're going to do it. Maybe within the week. God will help us to release another voice note before next week Sunday so that we could have crashed it out in our lives before we move ahead. There is so much. There is still so many Bible verses from Jesus we need to bring so that you can see clearly that this was the instructions from Jesus. This was the lifestyle that Jesus lived and this is the lifestyle that Jesus gave his disciples to live. This was the same lifestyle that the early church lived. This was the lifestyle that the apostles lived. This was the lifestyle. If you go back to church history, this was the lifestyle that those who gave their life to Jesus Christ many years ago, this was the lifestyle they lived. So what has happened to us now? We have all backslidden and gone our ways. I pray that God will help us in Jesus' name. So um, let me please bring this class to a close. Permit me that uh, send your questions in and we shall answer them. Shall we pray? Father God, we thank you for bringing us your word and your teachings. We ask today that you will help us to be poor in spirit. There is a spirit from your throne that help us to lose our life on earth so that we can gain heaven. There is a spirit from your throne that help us to limit the use of the mammon of unrighteousness so that we can gain heaven. Please, Lord, help us to follow after that spirit. Help us to be submissive to your spirit. We want to lose our life on earth so we can gain heaven. Help us to lose it, O oh God, and help us to gain eternal life. In Jesus' mighty name we are prayed. Amen. Thank you very Amen. much. God bless you. Have a wonderful mm. night, a wonderful evening. So if you have any question, please just send it to us and we'll respond to it. God bless you. Thank you. Bye-bye.